Thank you so much for coming to our webinar, Building a Security Program, Part 4, Control Freak Implementing Security Controls. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. You'll notice the questions box on your screen in the GoToWebinar tool. If you have a question during the webinar, please go ahead and type your question in the question pane. We'll have some time at the end of the webinar where we'll be answering all those questions as well. Also, after the webinar, we'll be emailing everybody a copy of the recording uh, of the slides. Um, excuse me, we'll be emailing everybody a copy of the recording and the slides. The webinar will also be available on demand for download on our website. Without further ado, let's get started. I'd like to introduce Paul Cayazzo. He's the co-founder and chief security architect here at TrueShield Security Solutions. Paul brings with him more than 15 years of experience in information security, as well as a master's degree in information security and assurance. As one of the key members of TrueShield's business development team, Paul's responsible for developing the corporate strategy and leading the technical product and service development efforts. Paul also has extensive experience in consulting and working with high-level executives at large corporations and government advising, and, and, excuse me, and government advising them on all things cybersecurity related. So with that, take it away, Paul. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and thank you, attendees, for coming and listening today to uh, Control Freak, our webinar about security controls. There is a lot of content to get through today, so I'm going to move uh, relatively quickly through this stuff. Um, but I would please invite, if you do have additional questions about security controls or how they may relate to your program, reach out to me. Uh, my email address is there. Uh, my LinkedIn contact information is there, as well as my Twitter account. So I will uh, respond to questions on any of those, so please do feel free to reach out. Um, so uh, TrueShield, just a little bit about us. Uh, we are a global company based in D.C. Uh, we've been in business for about 10 years. We've got clients all over the world. Um, we've done quite a lot of stuff with respect to control development and security program development. And uh, we try to tie that back into operational cybersecurity. Um, so if you're thinking about how to operationalize your security control programs, uh, that's an area that we've got a lot of expertise in. Um, but enough commercial, let's get to the meat of the agenda today. So roadmap to security. Um, we've been working through this uh, program of webinars for a few weeks now, actually more like a few months. And uh, we developed a five-step program for you uh, so that you can learn a little bit more about cybersecurity each step of the way. Uh, and essentially trying to establish the foundation of a good, functioning, mature, and sustainable security program. We started with governance, talking about how senior leadership needs to be bought into cybersecurity. We then moved into policies and how policy needs to meet both the rigors of regulation and the needs of the business. Uh, then we talked about process and how do we sustainably, repeatedly, reliably, and measurably implement security within our organizations. And today we're going to talk about controls. And controls are really how uh, uh, the rubber meets the road or where the rubber meets the road. What specific things do we need to do from a security program perspective to implement all the stuff that we've been talking about the last couple of months? Uh, we're going to end next month with oversight and compliance. Essentially, how do we make sure that we're still doing what we need to be doing uh, maybe a year from now or just on an ongoing basis? So uh, security control programs, um, they look like this. Uh, this is the kind of um, the notional architecture of how a security program looks uh, from our methodology standpoint. Again, it starts with governance. Uh, policies support governance uh, and drive process. Process is implemented by controls. And oversight and compliance takes information from that entire stack and feeds it back up to governance so that they can make better risk-based risk decisions and better risk management decisions. Uh, the agenda for today, we're going to be talking about frameworks. I'm going to give you some examples of control frameworks. We're going to talk about how the control development process works, and we're going to dive deep into one particular control framework that we feel is pretty applicable to most organizations out there um, and talk about why we think that is the case. Um, again, there's quite a bit of content to get through, so I am going to move relatively quickly. Uh, first off, so what's a framework? The frameworks uh, that we're going to talk about around security controls and around security programs in general, you should look at them as a blueprint. Um, but a blueprint, I think there's one, one problem with this analogy, is that a, a blueprint really is meant to be followed to the letter, whereas a framework is meant to be uh, um, something that's tailored to your organization. So the framework is going to give you a very good jumping off point, but it's not something that can be simply copy pasted into your environment and expect it to be functional or practical or something that's going to actually work for you. Uh, it's got to be tailored, and that's something to bear in mind as we run through this entire webinar today. Um, there's no one uh, uh, control framework that's going to be perfect for everybody. Uh, there are some that are, are tied to specific regulations, and there are some that are more generic or industry driven. Um, and uh, each of them may be suitable to you, and there's some work that's got to be done on your side to analyze the business objectives uh, and kind of what the overall corporate strategy is, what the corporate culture is from a security standpoint, 
Um, a lot of that's going to flow down through the governance channels that we talked about in a couple previous webinars, uh, down to control frameworks. I wanted to give you some examples of some control frameworks that we've done a lot of work with. Um, there are many out there. Uh, these are ones that, uh, um, again, we've got years of experience using. There are more in addition to this, but just to quickly run through this. So ISO 27001, uh, 2009 is an update. So there's actually a 2013 update as well. Um, this is a, a control framework that's very good for uh, industry at large. And uh, anybody that's in a, a, an engineering or manufacturing or research and development sort of organization, ISO is probably a, a, a pretty good place to start. Um, if you're a government organization, uh, the NIST documentation is a great place to look for frameworks. What you're seeing there, NIST Special Publication 837, is what's called the Risk Management Framework. Uh, and that's based upon NIST Special Publication 853, which is a set of security controls that are applicable to federal information systems um, and also applicable to uh, um, uh, pu uh, public sector and private sector as well. Uh, just again, need to be tailored to make sure that they fit within the constraints of your organization. Uh, the PCI DSS, that's the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. Uh, that's a very technically focused control set that's uh, really tailored to those organizations that have to process payment card information. So if you have any sort of maybe an e-commerce portal or even if you take payments from your customers via payment cards, the PCI DSS is something that you need to be looking at, at least understanding how your existing security program maps to it. Uh, very likely that you'll have to attest that you at some point in time have done that crosswalk. So certainly something to become comfortable with. The CSC20, that's the Critical Security Controls 20. Uh, it's known by a number of other names. Consensus Audit Guidelines is one. Uh, the SANS Top 20 is another. And that's actually the framework that we're going to dive into in depth today. Uh, and the reason being is that the SANS 20 Critical Security Controls, it's not tied to any one specific industry, and it's highly tailorable, tailorable to whichever organization is actually trying to implement a functional security program. Uh, FedRAMP is next on the list there, and that's really focused on cloud security systems, I'm sorry, cloud solution providers, or CSPs, that are trying to uh, provide services into the federal government. Uh, the government realized that they needed to apply the standards found in that NIST document immediately to FedRAMP's left uh, to the cloud servicers, and there's a bunch of idiosyncrasies about how that needs to be done, from mostly from a control ownership perspective. And what I mean by that is, where does the cloud service provider's responsibility come in? Um, where does the government organization's responsibility come in? And FedRAMP tries to delineate a lot of that. Um, there's still some organization tailoring that needs to be done even within FedRAMP, but the intent there is to give government uh, um, agencies the ability to purchase cloud services that have been uh, assessed for their own security programs. Uh, the NERC CIP, that's the National Energy Industries uh, um, uh, Critical Infrastructure Protection uh, Program, and the idea there being highly focused on the energy industry and on energy generation, power plants, uh, utilities, things like that, and how do we establish a, a baseline of security controls that protects that critical infrastructure. That's really what that's focused on. There are many other frameworks out there. In addition to these, some that I can list off the top of my head include COBIT or ITIL. Uh, there, there are simply many others. Uh, and, and I think the, the real message here is that uh, those who are looking to build a security control program should review you know, a handful of frameworks. Uh, I've found that many of these frameworks are asking or, or kind of directing you to do similar or the same things, but a lot of times they use different language or they call one control something in one uh, framework and something else in another. So it's kind of what I call the same eggs in a different basket. Um, and the idea is really that you need to tailor the, the framework to fit your organization. Um, we do that via a security methodology that covers four key areas. And those four key areas for us are prevention, detection, containment, and eradication. <clears throat> Our goal is always to prevent as much as we possibly can. Um, however, knowing that no one's perfect, and that's been a security mantra of ours since day one, it's impossible to reduce risk to zero. Uh, what you can do is minimize risk to the greatest extent possible, but then that point zero 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 one percent that actually does get through you need to be able to detect as quickly as you possibly can, and there are some startling industry statistics around how quickly organizations can detect. The average is 210 days to detect an actual security incident, which is terrifying to me. Uh, and then once you detect it, you actually have to be able to contain and eradicate it. Containment means stopping that single malware download from you know, Facebook or that single phishing attack from spreading to become a data compromise. And there's a, there's a big difference between a, you know, a minor malware infection and a data breach, where you've actually started notifying clients, maybe engage law enforcement, things like that. The better job you can do detecting, the more easy it's going to be to contain. 
and the better you do at containing, the more easy it's going to be to eradicate. Uh, that's why we show these as all being interlinked, and uh, really you have to be strong in all of them in order for the entire program to function. Uh, what we're going to do today is crosswalk the SANS 20 critical security controls against these four areas and talk about how uh, SANS, uh, the, the, the 20 critical security controls, fits this, and also talk a little bit about the maturity model uh, that's built directly into the 20 critical security controls. So I'm going to jump in. We're going to look at, uh, again, the uh, 20 critical security controls. And as a preface to this next uh, um, section, I want to just quickly talk about how the SANS 20 is structured. Um, what I like most about the SANS 20 critical security controls is that it has a built-in maturity model. Uh, it starts with quick wins. Quick wins are those things which you can very quickly, easily do within your environment to show senior leadership and to show perhaps an auditor that you've made some uh, uh, progress towards automating cybersecurity. Uh, visibility attribution is kind of the next step on there, being able to gain visibility across the entire enterprise and being able to attribute um, some uh, aspect of an environment to a specific device or a specific user, things like that. Uh, the next level of maturity within the SANS 20 is configuration hygiene. So effectively, you've, uh, you've achieved some level of maturity, and now it's a matter of improving upon that and maintaining it. And then advanced is really <clears throat> for those most secure organizations that are you know, either trying to protect something very sensitive or have a very security-focused corporate culture. Um, ideally, every organization should be shooting for advanced, um, with the one caveat being that it's unwise to spend more on a cybersecurity control than you could potentially lose by failure of that control. So countermeasure spend has to be balanced against potential loss, and that's a, a key point to remember with this. Um, the other thing about the SANS 20 that I want to talk about is that it's a highly technically focused uh, security framework. There's um, essentially nothing in here that talks too much about policy or planning or anything like that. Um, and that is not to suggest to any audience member that those are not critical parts of a security program. But since this, uh, um, this webinar is more focused on control implementation, we thought it best to focus it on uh, the SANS 20 because we've already previously talked about policy and process in other webinars. So bear that in mind as we go through this, this is a highly technically focused uh, uh, control catalog. And the intent is to help you look at what are the 20 most important things that you should be doing from a cybersecurity standpoint and help build some maturity towards the goal of an advanced, sustainable, repeatable, and reliable security program. So uh, with, with that caveat and that kind of lead up, we'll talk about uh, control number one. Control number one is the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices. Really put, uh, simply put, the, the question we're trying to answer is, uh, what devices are on my network? Uh, and without being able to answer that question, you're going to have a very hard time answering the question, how secure am I? Uh, first and foremost, you have to know what devices are either plugged into your physical network or connected to your wireless network. Um, and you can do that by walking around your office with you know, a notebook and a pen, but wouldn't it be much better to have an automated asset inventory tool? And that's really the first quick win for Control 1, is deploy an automated asset inventory tool. There are many out there, um, and some are, are open source and free. Some are off-the-shelf off software that you purchase. Uh, the nice thing about the uh, kind of the paid versions of those tools is that there's likely to be some integration capable uh, or capability across many different controls that we're going to talk about. And one piece of guidance I would give you is that any security tool expenditure you're looking at to solve some of these controls, try to find those best tools that can address many of these controls at once. And there are several that kind of get lumped into this inventory area uh, that, can, that can really help you consolidate your costs, consolidate your administrative overhead, and, and achieve a high level of security pretty quickly uh, just simply by deploying one enterprise-grade type tool. Uh, the second uh, uh, step in the maturity model on this is, well, okay, so we've deployed the asset inventory, now let's maintain it. What does maintaining an asset inventory look like? Well, I doubt anybody listening to this, uh, this webinar has a static uh, uh, environment where literally nothing changes ever. It's, it's most likely the opposite of that. You probably have things changing every day. Um, and maintaining that asset inventory is important because without an a accurate, up-to-date, and complete inventory, you're not going to be able to maintain situational awareness over your security posture. And so that's something that's got to be updated. Now, if you're the organization where your security administrator is walking around with a notebook and a pen, 
it's going to be pretty hard to maintain that asset inventory, which is why that's the second step in maturity after you've deployed that automated uh, asset inventory. If you truly have this automated, and this is something that effectively runs on its own uh, and, and can be done uh, in that manner, and there, there are some tools out there that can support specifically that. Uh, I don't want to name any specific tools uh, because we're typically vendor agnostic when it comes to uh, um, security tools, and there are, there are many out there that can solve these problems. Um, so I would invite you to do some research around uh, that specific task area. And I'll, I'll say the same thing again when we get to some more tool-focused stuff a little bit later. Think more about the capability we're trying to deploy versus the product. Um, <clears throat> configuration hygiene is kind of the next step on that, and that's network access control. Uh, ne network access control in, in the context of this is a tool which can uh, identify when a machine is either plugged into your physical network or attaches to perhaps your VPN or something like that. And it does a quick check of that device to make sure that it's compliant with your security baselines um, before allowing it access to the network. And so that's taking the, the, the knowledge of the asset itself that it exists and layering on top of that the knowledge of that asset being configured correctly to comply with your own security policies. Super important thing to do. And I recommend everybody at least to be shooting to get to that configuration hygiene level. And then the last one there, advanced, using a PKI type of environment or public key infrastructure to uh, handle uh, device authentication prior to connecting to the private network. Um, most often, your network access control system can actually do that. Um, so if you deploy a good NAC, you can automate that key exchange so it's not really possible to have uh, uh, an unapproved or unknown or rogue device attached to the network. But again, bottom line for this control is if you don't know the devices that are on your network, you simply don't know how secure your network is. Uh, similarly, if you don't know what software is installed on the assets in your environment, you don't know how secure your environment is. And so 20, uh, critical security control number two is the authorized and unauthorized software inventory. Uh, it's, it's an imperative thing you know what software is uh, deployed throughout your environment uh, because without it, uh, you're not going to know what patches you require. Um, you may have 20 different versions of Adobe uh, Acrobat Reader uh, installed throughout your environment, and I've certainly seen that. Uh, you may have many different versions of uh, uh, web browsers, for instance. Some users might use Chrome. Some users might use Firefox. Some users might use Safari. Some users might use IE. Uh, without having that documented in an inventory, it's going to be hard to say, well, Jim uses Chrome, and the Adobe plugin for Chrome is outdated, so we've got to go and update it. Uh, so that inventory is really, really important to make you effective at keeping your cyber hygiene stuff up to date, the patching, the upgrades, the updates, et cetera. Um, I would typically recommend that you simply choose fewer options for people to have in terms of, of things like web browsers and try to minimize the number of approved applications uh, authorized to be installed throughout the environment. But one way or another, uh, whether you have that, that good uh, you know, truncated list of approved software or not, you still have to have a good asset inventory. Now, again, you could have your security administrator walking around with a notebook and a pen uh, documenting what programs are installed, but there's a much better way to do that, and that's through an automated software asset inventory tool. Uh, the nice thing about these tools is, again, the enterprise-grade ones typically will integrate with the hardware asset inventory and also typically will integrate with the tools that you're going to use to fix those problems, uh, like the outdated Adobe plugin, for instance. And that's really what you want to be shooting for, again, is that consolidation of capabilities amongst a, a couple of key tools that you know inside and out and deploy completely throughout your environment. Um, of course, again, uh, similarly to the hardware inventory, the next step once you've deployed that is to maintain it. Um, and again, largely this can be automated through one of those enterprise-grade tools. Maintaining that asset inventory from a software perspective is super, super important. Uh, simply for that reason I talked about earlier, uh, if you have many different versions of software running in your environment and let's say Microsoft releases an update for a very specific tool, uh, you need to know whether or not you've got to uh, deploy that patch, whether or not that security uh, bulletin is applicable to you, and then where you've got to deploy assets to actually go and fix this stuff. Um, and then uh, the next on configuration hygiene, we're, we're going to talk about NAC again, uh, because again, NAC is a very good tool for assessing a device's configuration before giving it access to the network. Uh, and and uh, similarly to the previous one, uh, the intent here being uh, to not allow access to the network for devices that are either running unauthorized software or don't have the right authorized software. The, I think the most prevalent example of that that a NAC does is it takes a look at your antivirus programs installed on computers that are perhaps attaching to the VPN. Uh, so perhaps you've got a roaming user uh, that calls back over their VPN client. Your network access control system takes a look at that device and says, oh, 
this one doesn't have the right uh, signatures for its antivirus program, so I'm not going to allow access to the network until the signatures get updated. And then there's usually a script that's automatically generated without you know, the user having to do anything that goes and updates those uh, um, uh, signatures so that they then can get access to the network. And you know, attempting to automate all this stuff is really the, the, the core focus of the SANS 20 critical security, security controls. Remove the potential for human error as much as you possibly can. Um, last one on there for advanced uh, uh, um, uh, capability within this uh, uh, control set is again that similar PKI infrastructure for software inventory. Again, we'll tie directly into the NAC uh, if you're using an enterprise grade NAC um, and it can help, uh, um, help achieve the high level of automation to make this so that it's effectively not possible for a human to get in the middle of it and screw it up for you. Because unfortunately we are usually our own worst enemies when it comes to security. Uh, so control tree is secure configuration. So now we talked about uh, uh, hardware inventory, we talked about software inventory, Configuration is really just the next logical step there. Um, when you think about security, I, I try to think about it in the context of a couple of, of kind of core concepts. And one of those is least privilege, the concept of least privilege. Configure your devices so that they're able to do the bare minimum that they need to do to actually be able to do the job that's required of them. Um, and there are some things that you can do in configuration baselines like locking down USB drives or enforcing a very strong password policy or making it so that users can't uh, um, uh, install new applications, things like that. And you can kind of see how that ties into the previous control with authorized software inventories, and uh, it will also tie into some of the next ones as well. Um, the quick one for this is the automated patching tools. Um, so now I think a lot of uh, people that I've talked to about this think that simply turning on Microsoft Auto Update solves the problem here, and unfortunately that's not really the case. Uh, Microsoft Auto Update can help with some of, of these things, but one thing I'd always caution organizations to think about when they turn that on is that those patches, you know, there's a, at least some potential for them to disrupt the normal operations. Uh, and I've seen patches break things in the past. I think it's much less likely today than it has been historically. But if you happen to be an organization that relies heavily upon, for instance, a Java virtual machine version that's hard coded into some legacy application that you coded yourself, uh, you know, updating Java might not be a good idea for you. And if it's automated, uh, um, you know, to the extent that you don't even have the ability to, to cancel an update, then that could potentially break some stuff. But there are many enterprise-grade uh, patching tools out there that can do the hardware inventory, do the software inventory, uh, assess the configuration of the devices, and also help you automate the patching process for uh, updates that are required. Um, and I would highly recommend that you do try to center around one tool that can do all of that stuff. Um, the next um, visibility attribution, you know, this is one that I think would, would actually save a huge amount of time for most of the organizations I talk to. Certainly when you get to the kind of large enterprise or even, you know, when you start approaching the, the upper mid-sized company, you, you probably have a high need for uh, devices to be procured and delivered to your environment. And wouldn't it be nice if your vendor shipped those pre-configured? Um, and, and used your standard images so that you, all you had to do is take it out of the box, plug it into the network, and you're, you're off and running. Um, that's what we do for our security appliances that we ship to our clients. Uh, we have you know, pre-configured devices that our OEM vendor installs an image on our device and then ships it out. Um, it saves a huge amount of administrative burden for us, and additionally, it makes it so that they're the same every time. And that's, that's really what you should be trying to shoot for here, is that all of your devices should be configured the same, uh, because if they are, then you're going to have a much easier time exercising control over them. Um, and the other thing which is kind of implied here, um, but not explicitly stated, is that you should have standard images. Um, if you don't have good gold images for your devices, you know, your, your accounting profile, for instance, should have X pieces of software on it and, and should have Y registry settings and should have Z administrative privileges. If that hasn't been done for the different roles within your environment or even just a single uh, gold image for the entire environment and you overlay stuff on top of that, you really do need to do that. And that's something you need to be updating probably quarterly uh, at a minimum. Keep your, your gold images up to date because the gold images should bake in all of those security hotfixes and, and should, should have only the approved software and should have the right registry settings and things like that. And that's going to make your job as a security professional much easier going forward because you can simply monitor for compliance against that, that baseline configuration and then report up to, uh, up to senior leadership that you know, we're 98% compliance and there's this 0.2% we've got to go figure out. Um, or, you know, uh, um, better put, you know, we know our, our environment is secure because everybody's got that same security baseline and we've tested it. Uh, and, and that's something you should definitely be shooting for. 
the next one on here is remote administration over secure channels. So really what we're talking about here is these tools that we're going to implement to do automated uh, um, patching and, and device inventory, that's very sensitive information and it should be treated securely. And so all the stuff that we're describing here should be encrypted as it transits the wire. Um, so if you're doing things like uh, perhaps remote administration of a firewall or of a Linux server and you're not using SSH, um, you know, bad, bad job. You should be doing that over a secure channel. Um, if you're uh, um, using remote desktop, Microsoft remote desktop, uh, there is encryption built into that, but I would recommend you don't open that up to the internet, for instance. So things like RDP should be closed down from the outside. But one way or another, the, the bottom line is uh, uh, remote administration has to be done for secure channels because if someone were to be running a network sniffer on your network, um, they'd know what patches you're missing. And if they know what patches you're missing or what, what configurable items are weak or broken, they're going to know exactly how to attack you uh, successfully. So it's important to do that uh, securely. And then advanced on here is the automated configuration monitoring system. So now for those of you who have been following along, the uh, automated patch management tools and the automated uh, network access control tools, things like that, can do this for you. And so the, the intent, again, is to try to center around a single tool that can accomplish all of those things. Now, the one caveat I'm going to give you for that is that these are generally very complex uh, uh, sort of tools that need professional services uh, to go along with just the tool purchase so that they're actually implemented correctly. I've seen organizations spend colossal sums on tools like this and then fail to implement them correctly and then further fail to operate them. Uh, and that's one thing I would highly recommend. The investment in your tool set has to be backed up by an investment into operations and maintenance for these tool sets. Uh, otherwise, you're really not going to get the value out of it that, that you're, you're seeking when you invest in it in the first place. Uh, control number four is continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation. So this is the ongoing vulnerability scans. This is something you have to be doing. Uh, if you're not doing regular vulnerability scanning, I recommend at least once a month. Uh, in some cases, for highly secure environments, we try to do this once a day. Uh, if you're not doing that, um, you know, daily is probably uh, a difficult thing for a lot of organizations to accomplish. You should certainly try to do this on a, uh, a monthly basis for your entire environment, every asset in the environment. Uh, and that is, it, it should be done on an automated basis. Uh, there are enterprise-grade scanning tools out there that can do this for you uh, so that you can schedule them to run overnight. Uh, so that they're not going to be disruptive for the network or for your operational environment. There are also managed services uh, organizations that can do this for you. Uh, we're one of them. Um, and uh, that's something that, that uh, is very important to do because if you're not aware of what vulnerabilities you have, you're really not going to be able to secure your environment. Um, you have to be able to additionally not just know where the vulner vulnerabilities exist, you have to be able to go and quickly fix them. Um, and the idea behind there is, Everyone on this uh, webinar, including ourselves, has limited resources to respond to security incidents. And so you have to be focused on those which are most critical to the environment to fix first. And so the, the preceding three uh, um, critical security controls really kind of add up to this. So if you have a good asset inventory, you know where your critical devices are. You have a good software inventory, you know what software is installed throughout the environment. You have a good configuration baseline, so you know how the devices are configured. Now you know what's vulnerable and you know where your critical weaknesses are so that you can direct resources to go and fix quickly. Uh, always best to do this in an automated fashion, which is why that visibility attribution next uh, level of maturity is uh, um, tied to this. Again, we're talking about automated patch management. There are a lot of tools out there, again, those enterprise grade endpoint management tools that can do the vulnerability assessment and the remediation of them uh, um, kind of in a single pane of glass. Uh, they're costly, so I'll, I'll caution you there, but they are effective. Uh, so that's a, a balancing act that you need to be mindful of. Again, there are always managed services operations that can help uh, um, reduce some of these costs and achieve that same level of capability. Uh, the configuration hygiene for this one is simply let's get better over time. That's all that's saying. It's let's take a look at what we did last time, how well we did, what vulnerabilities did we have last time. Do we still have those vulnerabilities today? Because uh, that's going to help us understand where our weaknesses are from a remediation standpoint. Are there simply too many to keep up with? Um, are there certain devices that we're unable to fix because there's a legacy application that we don't want to break? Uh, those are you know, useful um, um, pieces of information for you to be able to understand your security posture. And so you really do need to be doing that trend analysis uh, over time, not just back to back from preceding one to this one, but maintain uh, at least something like a trend line that's going to show you whether or not you're reducing your overall risk over time, whether you're getting better, or worse, or, or stagnating. It's important to be able to do that. Uh, critical security control five is malware defenses. Uh, you know, tied similarly to the preceding one, this is more talking about antivirus, anti-malware stuff. 
Um, and a quick one here is, of course, to use antivirus and anti-malware. Um, if you don't have an antivirus or anti-malware tool or a host-based IDS or IPS, uh, I, I, I feel sorry for you. You really need to have that because if you don't have something like that, you're just asking for trouble. Uh, so there are many out there. There are some that are free. There are some that will integrate with the endpoint control systems that I just discussed. Uh, but one way or another, you have to have something. Uh, and it's best to have that be a stack of, of capabilities on that device, uh, which, which will enable you to do the malware prevention, the antivirus updates, um, also host-based IDS, perhaps a, a, a host-based firewall. It's really great if you can do registry inspection directly from that uh, um, application as well. Because a lot of times, modern malware, what it will do is it will make some registry changes uh, that your you know, standard antivirus might not pick up, but a good uh, um, anti-malware would be able to see a registry change. And that should be an indicator that your security operations center or your managed services provider uses to tell you whether or not there's an indicator of compromise in the environment. Uh, the next on visibility or attribution is simply let's make sure we keep up to date. Uh, and let's make sure that we're using behavior-based stuff in addition to signature-based stuff. So first off, let's keep the signatures updated. So on a daily basis, we're doing signature downloads. And then let's make sure we're supplementing that capability with a, a behavior-based uh, technology. Now, there's a good reason for this. Uh, signature-based stuff is effective uh, at picking up known risks or known pieces of malware. And it's very, very fast. So if, a, for instance, a known piece of malware were to land on a device in your environment, your antivirus should be able to pick that up pretty much immediately because it matches the signature. Um, and it's, it's, at that point, kind of a low computing cost. Now, for stuff that your antivirus system hasn't seen before, or what's known as a zero day, if you're familiar with that term, something that is brand new, uh, that nobody's written a signature for yet, uh, there's going to be some new behavior that that device is going to have that your, your system should be able to pick up on. Um, and that behavior-based stuff is what's really going to be the bridge between all those known vulnerabilities, known malwares, and the brand new stuff that is the nastiest stuff coming out of the wild, wild west. Uh, so, so use both, uh, and, and definitely don't think of one as being a replacement for the other. If you only use behavior-based stuff, you're going to end up spending a lot more on uh, you know, trying to detect and the, the known risks, the known vulnerabilities. So make sure that you're using both in that regard. Um, and then lastly here, advanced for this is dom domain name system query logging. So the idea here being when a, a sophisticated piece of malware uh, lands on a device in your environment, one of the first things that it does is it beacons out to command and control nodes. And that's C2, command and control. So that beacon traffic is something that you can pick up on the network. And uh, that's something that at your firewall or at your network edge, you should see outbound traffic heading to a known malicious IP address or a known malicious command and control domain. Now, the question that begs is, well, how do I know they're malicious? And that's an area where a managed services provider such as us can help. Uh, there are also some subscription services that you can uh, subscribe to from you know, organizations, not just us, but many others, where you can get these databases of known malicious IP addresses. And then it's incumbent upon you to actually use them, integrate them with your network edge uh, security controls to be able to see that. If you can pick that up, uh, if you can pick up that beacon traffic and then immediately take action, then you're going to stop a malware download from being a data compromise. And again, that's the difference between a mature and an immature security program. Really important that you're able to do that because that's kind of the containment aspect of uh, our um, uh, uh, stack that we talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> so next on the Critical Security Controls 20 is uh, control number six, application software security. So make sure that you're using supported versions of software. Um, this is, you know, it seems kind of self-explanatory, but uh, if you're using an end of support or end of life application or even a piece of hardware, uh, you're no longer getting security updates for that. Now, the problem with that is the bad guys may still be generating new vulnerabilities or may be generating new exploits that apply to those uh, softwares or those devices, but the vendor is basically saying, well, tough. We're not doing anything about it anymore. And if you're still using something that's unsupported, then you're, you're going to have to either spend a huge amount of money getting some custom support from Microsoft, which they'll do for colossal sums, um, or you're simply going to be in a continuous state of risk and, and no real way of getting better. So you know, uh, better than that, just simply use supported software uh, uh, or hardware. Uh, that should be a relatively simple thing for most organizations to do. But when you take a look at things like your firewalls, and I've seen this a lot recently because there was a significant investment in firewalls about five or six years ago. A lot of those are coming end of life now. Make sure that you keep up to date on them because you know, the firewall vendors are going to stop producing patches for those older platforms in an attempt to get you to move to their next generation platforms. But additionally, uh, even if you're not going to move to a next-gen platform, you've got to make sure that you're using supported stuff. 
Uh, next on this is what's called output sanitation. Uh, don't display system error messages to end users. Those error messages give uh, some information away about problems with an application that if you're a malicious insider or a bad guy, um, you can use that to uh, either gain more information about the system that you're working in um, or figure out a way to exploit some risk or some vulnerability that maybe you don't even know about. Uh, so there are usually ways to suppress those messages in most applications. If no other option exists, there's usually a group policy object or GPO that you can use to uh, limit that sort of uh, output uh, display. Um, and that's something that's important to do. Uh, the next on the list, configuration hygiene. Uh, so you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but training. Let's make sure that the people that are, are writing code for any sort of uh, um, custom developed application have been trained in security. Uh, application security is super important. Uh, as we know, if we're not building security into our applications, we're going to have to lay security on after the fact, which is going to be way more expensive. And it's better to have your application developers trained in security so that they're using a secure systems development lifecycle. Uh, next on the list, uh, control seven, wireless access control. Quick win here is that we need to make sure that the devices that are connected to our wireless network meet the right configuration standards. Similarly to how we talked about the inventory of authorized devices earlier, same kind of deal here, and it ties into that network access control system that you see is a configuration hygiene. Um, prior to configuration hygiene, though, there are tools called WID, a wireless intrusion detection system, that will help you identify rogue wireless devices. What I've seen very commonly is, let's say an executive wants to have a private wireless network in their office, and so they bring in a Linksys router, like the one you see on the screen there, and plug it into the network. And all of a sudden, uh, they've given access by a side channel, totally outside of your control, to anybody that happens to attach to that wireless network, because you can be pretty sure they didn't do it securely, or at least not as securely as you wanted them to. Um, so WIDs will help you identify that sort of stuff. A NAC is another mechanism for uh, um, it's ensuring that devices are configured correctly. We talked at length about previously, and, and I won't get back into it, but again, similarly to how we discussed before, the NAC should also enable you to do PKI for device uh, um, authentication. Important, again, try to automate as much as you possibly can. Uh, control number eight is data recovery. So data recovery, this I think is one of those areas that's fairly well known or fairly well understood within security but not really practiced very well. I think we all know we've got to be doing backups, and we all know that we've got to test for stores and things like that. But I think, by and large, a lot of organizations fail to do that test for store. And what's going to happen then, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to press a bruise for some of you guys, you're going to get hit by CryptoLocker. Uh, your, your stuff's going to get uh, um, you know, encrypted on you, and you're going to have to restore from the backup. And then all of a sudden, you're going to find out that your backup was not viable, and you weren't able to restore the data. So really important to be testing uh, the restoration of, of your backups and do that, I would say, pretty regularly. Uh, you also want to make sure that you are uh, physically protecting your backed up data. Um, you can do that via uh, either a cloud backup solution and just rely upon the cloud service provider to take care of that control for you, or you can move those to some off-site uh, um, uh, storage vendor for uh, backups. But really important to be doing backups, and I know it's one of those basic remedial practices in cybersecurity, but it can't be uh, uh, underemphasized. Um, okay, next is the uh, control nine, skills assessment and appropriate training. This should be fairly self-explanatory too. Uh, the people that are within your organization need to understand security, they, and especially those that have a, any sort of significant security responsibility. They need to know how to use the tools. Uh, so number one, everybody's got to get cybersecurity 101. What, what risks are I, or am I uh, you know, potentially responsible for bringing into the environment? Um, you know, uh, the anti-phishing stuff is important to include in that, but just the basics. Everybody in the company should get the basics, including the senior executive staff. Uh, and then additionally, you need to be able to test whether or not people are, are kind of listening when, when you give them these uh, um, uh, you know, skills assessments and, and this training program. So you know, a good way to do that is via quizzes um, or via those ongoing anti-phishing assessments just to see if they're really listening. Um, and then the other uh, uh, really important part of this is that if there are any mission critical personnel or people that are, are particularly responsible for the security of the organization, invest in them, train them, make sure that they understand how to use the tools that you've paid a ton of money for uh, so that you can actually get value out of them. Again, self-explanatory to probably most of you on the phone today, but I, I, it's, it's surprising to me how little investment some organizations give into their, into their team for training purposes. Um, so that's number 10, security configuration for network devices. So make sure your network devices are locked down. I talked a little earlier about the concept of least functionality. That's the same idea here. Let's make sure things like firewall rules are limited to the, the greatest extent possible. And so only those ports and protocols that we absolutely require are available uh, and open to anyone. Uh, and additionally, that we're using the correct kind of segmentation 
uh, within the network to make sure that uh, um, there, there is security kind of built into the network architecture. Um, and then, uh, of course, the management of devices has to be done securely as well. Um, if your router configuration were exposed or if your firewall configuration were exposed, that could be potentially damaging to you. So you want to make sure that you're using encrypted sessions to uh, administer those things. And I think even more so, you want to make sure you're using the two-factor authentication. So you're not just relying upon using even a password. Passwords are weak and easily cracked. Um, and multi-factor authentication is going to make it an order of magnitude more difficult for a bad guy to get in the middle there. Um, that last one, advanced, uh, managed network infrastructure across a separate network connection. So what we're talking about there is a management network versus your production network. Most servers are going to have multiple network interface cards. Um, and what we recommend is that you take at least one of those ports and establish a management network so that you can jump into the management interface and all of that uh, stuff that we talked about for patching and backups and things like that occur over that network instead of your production network that your users are attached to, for instance. That's going to really make it almost impossible for a bad guy to sniff traffic that's of you know, any real import uh, to you. Um, and additionally, make it so that your network is optimized so that stuff like backups and patching doesn't impact your regular network operation flow because uh, it can be you know, kind of saturating for your network. Uh, control number 11 is very closely tied to this. Uh, limitation and control of network ports, protocols, and services. Again, same sort of thing there, least privilege, least functionality is what we're trying to shoot for. Uh, only those ports, protocols, and services that have actual business needs are running. Uh, and you've got to actually check that on a regular basis to make sure that you're not uh, the business needs of last year are, are still valid, and if they're not, then turn those rules off. Uh, the visibility attribution component of this is, um, first off, if you have a DMZ, good. Make sure that there's only uh, devices in there that are truly needed to be accessed from the Internet, um, uh, or perhaps over a secure VPN from a business partner or something like that. Don't have stuff that's visible to the Internet uh, that doesn't need to be. Um, that sounds self-explanatory to some security people, but it's a, something that's often overlooked. Uh, critical services should be on separate devices. So things like DNS and file servers and mail servers and web servers or Active Directory, I hope those aren't all on one device in your environment uh, because if that device happens to go down, first off, you're going to be out of business. But second off, if I gain illicit access to that device, I've gained access to everything. Um, so try to separate those off logically by putting them on different, uh, um, different either virtual machines or physical machines. And then lastly here, try to put application firewalls in front of critical servers. Um, that's an advanced step, but it's important, especially if you have an application server that um, serves up uh, anything like PII or personal identifiable information or personal health information or any sort of payment card things. Make sure that you can validate the traffic going to and from that server so it's not possible to do things like code injection. Uh, control number 12 is the controlled use of administrative privileges. So we talked about least functionality a lot. This is what's called least privilege or need to know. So your users should not be sitting on their uh, laptops or their computers uh, with administrator privileges. There's a very good reason for this. Uh, uh, when a piece of malware is downloaded and executed in runtime by the user, um, it's going to run under that user's security context. And if the user has administrative level access to that device, it's going to do whatever the heck it wants to it. It's going to make registry changes. It's going to install software. It's going to go and, and you know, run some network probing tools or whatever else it can possibly do. If it's simply a user account that you lock down sufficiently, that piece of malware is going to be able to do much, much, much less and be much less risky to you in the long run. So I know it's, it's usually controversial to take away people's administrative privileges, but at the end of the day, it's a, a great way to minimize risk with your environment, and I would highly recommend you do it for everybody except those few people that need administrative access. And that includes your executives. Yes, it's going to be hard for you to convince your CEO that he shouldn't have administrative privileges on his computer, but at the end of the day, he shouldn't. Um, and then additionally, if you have the ability to use private key uh, infrastructure for authentication, make sure you secure those private keys. Uh, that's an important aspect of it too, because if, if you know, I were to compromise your private key database, then your entire authentication system is you know, mine for the taking. Um, it's a really important one. Try to minimize administrative privileges as much as you can in your environment. Control number 13 is boundary defenses. Um, <clears throat> So similarly to how we talked about uh, things like uh, controlled use supports and protocols, boundary defenses kind of ties into that because what we're talking about here is what's allowed in and out of the network. Uh, we, we try to support this by whitelisting where possible and blacklisting where whitelisting is not possible. Whitelisting is uh, those, those organizations or en entities outside of our environment that we know and trust and we know we're going to accept traffic from them because we know and trust them. 
we've perhaps done a risk assessment over that third-party vendor, and we know that they've implemented a good security program. So we can whitelist traffic from them because we trust it. For anybody else, uh, uh, especially for things that are untrusted or uh, I talked about earlier malicious command and control uh, nodes out on the Internet, those should be blacklisted as we become aware of them. Um, and there are reputation databases that you can use to help support that. Um, of course, you can use a managed security services provider like us to do that for you. Um, but that's something you should be doing because, again, if you can block that bad traffic at the network edge, then it's not going to have a chance to get in and land on a device in your environment. Uh, the next on the list here is that uh, SPF. Um, and so SPF records makes it possible for you to validate uh, where an email message is coming from, so it's not really possible to spoof, which is what you'll see most often happen in a, a successful phishing attack. Uh, so that's a good way to minimize the impact of a phishing attack. Um, additionally, if, if you have the ability to do this, to scan for those back channel connections to the Internet, so anybody that happens to have circumvented your uh, control process, your change control process, it's possible to maybe install a new circuit uh, that doesn't go through your security control architecture and goes around your firewall. You want to be checking for that sort of thing, things like network scans. Um, and then the last on here is the DMZ uh, three-tier hierarchy type deal. Um, so DMZ uh, um, systems, uh, they're, it's a very, the idea here is that there, there's a uh, um, high security need for those devices, but there's also a need for public access to information. So the ability to interact with those devices from the Internet must be there, but the, the ability to do it securely also must be there. And the intent is to ensure that it's not possible to jump from your DMZ into your internal network. Um, and so it's, you know, use things like application firewalls to uh, prevent things like code injections from enabling a bad guy on the outside to gain remote code access to a DMZ server and then use that to pivot to the inside. That's really all we're talking about there. Um, next on the list is, uh, this actually is continuation we were just talking about uh, for boundary defense. So network time protocol. So network time protocol, what's important about this is that your systems all generate security logs and those logs need to be time stamped the same so that when your security operation center needs to kind of piece together an attack vector, they're able to do that uh, and, and they can tie things together from a temporal or, or time-based standpoint. Um, and then again, of course, as we talked about a couple times, those boundary defenses on the network edge, things like firewalls, network-based IPSs, stuff like that. I'm sure you have a firewall uh, if you're listening to this. You should also back that up with an IDS or an IPS. The thing about an IPS is if it's in line, it's truly an IPS, uh, you got to be careful how you configure that because you can actually damage your network uh, pretty easily. Um, and I, actually, I think this is actually control number 14, not 13. Apologies for that. Uh, control number 15 is the controlled access based on need to know. So you heard me talk about least privilege, least functionality, and need to know. That's really what we're talking about here. Uh, for anybody that happens to be in a government organization uh, that deals with classified information or any sort of security clearance, uh, that type of environment, you're going to understand need to know pretty well. Um, because even though you may have, let's say, a top secret security clearance, if you don't have a need to know a specific piece of information, it doesn't matter if you have the right clearance level, you, it's not, not appropriate for you to see. And that's the same idea here. So first thing you're going to do is find that sensitive information and, and make sure we know where it exists and, and implement some controls around it to make sure that people can't get to it inappropriately. Uh, and you can do that with VLANs. Uh, you can do that with firewalls. There's, you can do that with encryption and access controls and things like that. There's a bunch of different ways to solve that problem, but step one is understanding where your data is and, and how, how sensitive it is. Um, the one thing on here that I'm going to harp on is that configuration hygiene, uh, segmentation of the network based on trust levels. The reason that one is so important is because they're, um, the better you do at that, the more you're going to be able to contain an, an issue on your network. Um, if, for instance, you know, Joe in accounting were to go out to Facebook and accidentally download a piece of malware, and Joe in accounting is on the same local network segment as perhaps your most sensitive customer information database, it's a relatively simple thing for that piece of malware to probe its adjacent systems and hop from Joe's computer to that uh, database computer. But uh, on, on the alternative, if you do have a good uh, logically sent back in network and your user space, like where your Joe in accounting is, is on a separate segment from where that database server is, it's going to be very hard for that piece of malware to jump over to that other device where the more sensitive information is without you seeing it, um, and preferably by stopping it at, at a firewall or something along those lines. Really important you do that. And if you're, if you're one of those organizations that says, well, we have a pretty flat network, um, take the time to, to put some thought into how your network should be re-architected to support security. Um, if, if that foundation doesn't exist, it's going to be really hard to contain and eradicate. Uh, so it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, let's see. So next we've got data protection. 
so hard drive encryption, this is really what we're talking about here. So if you have any devices that are like laptops or mobile devices or things like that where people are roaming, uh, make sure that the hard drive is encrypted so that if it gets stolen or picked up off of a, a you know, a cable in Starbucks and, and somebody walks away with it, they're not going to be able to do anything with it because the hard drive is encrypted. Uh, and usually you can uh, uh, configure that so that it, it basically bricks the system uh, before uh, um, you know, somebody tries a, a bad password five or six times. Um, the next one is to scan your, your servers to find that sensitive data uh, that's in clear text. This is closely tied to the uh, PCI uh, control set that we talked about earlier. If you have things like credit card data or passwords or any other sensitive data stored in clear text, it's easy for a bad guy to, to get that. So make sure your databases are encrypted is what we're talking about there. Uh, Network-based DLP, uh, data loss prevention. You want to know what information is flowing out of your network because that's probably sensitive information that's leaving your network at 2 in the morning. And you want to make sure you keep uh, um, uh, abreast of that. So DLP solutions can help you do that. There, there's another situation where the legwork has to be done with that quick win before that's going to be useful. Because if you don't know where your important information is and you haven't done the physical protection stuff of it, it kind of doesn't matter if you've got a good DLP because you're not going to know what to monitor. Um, and it's important to be able to do that. So step one, make sure you know where your sensitive data is. Uh, next is incident response. So incident response is so important because as we said earlier, you're not going to be able to prevent everything. You may not even be able to detect everything quickly. Uh, so when you do detect that stuff, you need to be able to execute crisply and immediately on, on removing those sorts of indicators of compromise from your environment. Start with creating that incident response plan. Uh, the incident response plan is going to help you assign those job titles and duties for people that are responsible for responding to the incident. Uh, really important that that's in a document someplace that people have read and understood and have been trained on. Part of that training is the periodic incident scenario sessions. Um, so we like to do that quarterly and we'd like to update incident response plans annually because uh, things are going to change in your environment. Uh, that quarterly exercise should include everybody that's got any kind of hook into incident response, including senior leadership. Because at the end of the day, senior leadership is ultimately accountable, uh, and so they need to be at least informed uh, for an, any kind of security incident. But your security operations center, your security engineers, your IT engineers, people like that, also uh, business owners from like your uh, different lines of business within your organization need to be involved in that, uh, at least from a situational awareness and, and visibility standpoint. And there are some good documents out there that will help you build the incident response plan for you. Uh, NIST 861 is one of them. Uh, that's NIST Special Publication 800-61. It's a good place to start for that. Uh, control number 19, Secure Network Engineering. I talked a little bit about this earlier, but what we're especially talking about here is network segmentation and making sure you're using a DMZ to protect your critical internal assets from the Internet. And then additionally, making sure that your critical internal assets are segmented to the enterprise into separate trust zones because you have a, a different level of security that you have to apply to a critical database than what you have to apply to a desktop that the user sits at. Um, that's a fancy way of saying make sure you've impl implemented VLANs in your network to segment traffic between different uh, um, uh, security domains. Important to do, again, from a containment standpoint. Um, and the last critical security control we're going to talk about is penetration tests. Uh, so, so you've done all this work of implementing all these security controls. How do you know whether or not they're working? It's, you need to have an independent entity perform a penetration test for you. And that is going to assess whether or not all these controls that we discussed earlier today are actually functional and actually working to protect the organization from compromise. It has to be an independent entity. Um, if it's the same organization that built the program for you, uh, they're going to have a vested interest of not exposing the holes. So it's got to be somebody else. Uh, and uh, it's always important to have that be you know, a certified uh, organization that's done penetration testing before, not just an IT vendor. It's a very uh, niche kind of skill set. And additionally, it's a very good opportunity to test whether or not your detection capability can pick up uh, the uh, uh, attacks. So during your penetration test, make sure you know, things like your log management uh, and stuff like that have actually um, uh, uh, picked up on, on the risk that we're at that the penetration test is trying to actually exploit. Um, so one thing about controls is that uh, when you're trying to develop controls, they've got to be repeatable, they've got to be scalable, they've got to be sustainable, and they've got to be measurable. So similar to how we talked about process earlier, um, if, you're not, if you're not kind of measuring yourself against these four metrics, then your controls are going to be kind of difficult to implement, difficult to control. So keep that in mind as you're building these controls out. Um, and then one thing we were asked recently is control inheritance. So if you're working with a managed services provider uh, to you know, help you with, with some of these controls or help actually operate in, in, a, in a managed services model, where does their responsibility begin and end and where does your be, yours begin and end? 
So an inherited control is something that the MSP is going to uh, do for you. A hybrid control is going to be partially their responsibility, partially your responsibility. And then a system-specific control is usually the entire responsibility of the customer. And a good MSP should be able to crosswalk that uh, uh, for you and help you understand where your responsibility lies and, and where, where theirs does. But it's always important to keep that big picture in mind. It, you got to have capability across all four of these domains. Uh, and your weakest link is going to be the one that gets you in the end. So make sure that you've thought about these four things um, and thought about how these 20 critical security controls can apply to them. And um, that should help you get a pretty good leg up on the bad guy and, and maybe tip the scales back into your advantage. Um, so with that said, I'm going to open the floor to questions. It looks like we do have a couple here. Um, all right, so question I've got here is, um, does this control framework CSC20 have to follow the latest release version C or 6.0 from CIS guys in order to prioritize these cyber security threats? Um, so the control framework, it, it, it's again, it's, it's um, it doesn't necessarily need to follow any specific guidance from any organization. It should be tailored to your organization. So you mentioned the Center of Internet Security Guidelines, uh, the newest version of that. And I think that's a, also, CIS is a great organization to go to for things like configuration baselines. Um, they've developed a lot of automation and a lot of manual configuration baselines for many different technologies. And it's a great way to support what we talked about today. But I don't necessarily think they need to be linked to one another. So intrinsically, um, they should support one another for sure. Uh, but not necessarily, doesn't have to be based on the other one. And hopefully that answers your question there. Uh, another question, my company needs a security program within the next month to stand up to an audit. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry for you. Uh, which of the frameworks that we discussed today is the quickest way to show the auditor that we have something in place? So the quickest way for you to show that you've made some progress is uh, to try to uh, map your program to these 20 critical security, critical security controls and then uh, show how you've addressed the quick wins. Um, at least get those quick wins addressed. And then you can say to your CISO or to your internal auditor, you know, this is our plan, this is our roadmap, here's where we're at today, and that's going to answer the mail for most of those questions you're going to get. As long as you can show that you've got some target state in mind and you've got some plan of how you're going to uh, tactically get to that strategic endpoint, uh, most auditors are going to be satisfied with that. What they're going to do, though, is they're going to hold you accountable to it. So next time they come and talk to you, you're going to have to show them progress above and beyond those quick wins onto things like configuration hygiene and hopefully a couple of advanced. Uh, that's a good place to start. Um, and the last question I got here is, what is the best way to ensure the responsibilities for my security controls are clearly defined so that if my company ever gets audited, we can show them who has responsibility for its control? So basically, who owns the control is the question here. Um, what we typically like to do for this is to create what's called a control catalog, which is just a fancy word for a big spreadsheet that has uh, all the different control families, um, like access controls and you know, audits and uh, um, risk assessments, things like that and then define in there via a column which organization within, you, within the company or within the government organization owns that particular control. And call it out right there, uh, make sure that that's published and you know, everybody signs off on it so there's no you know, repudiation possible. Everybody knows what their responsibility is and therefore it's easy at that point to attest to an auditor that you, you, you know who's responsible and they know who's responsible. Also important to do that uh, during incident response as well. Um, and that looks like that's the last question I have. So I would like to thank you guys for joining us today. I hope you found this informative. This was, again, the fourth out of five of our security program development series of webinars. Fifth, we'll be talking about uh, oversight and compliance and how everything that we talked about needs to be fed back up to governance and back up to senior leadership so that they can take steps to then make the program that much better. Uh, should you have any questions between now and then, you can feel free to reach us on either our website, the 800 number that's listed on the screen here, or the contact information that was on my uh, bio page earlier in the webinar. Again, we're going to be sending this out to all the attendees. It'll be available on our website. So if you did find this informative, uh, maybe let uh, one of your colleagues know that this is an interesting thing to watch. Um, and again, I appreciate your time. So thank you, and we'll see you next time.